Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to talk about preventing infections in patients treated with biologics. I hope for my talk to complement Dr. Looney's talk um, earlier um, this morning. And this is a big topic, and I hope to hit the highlights. I'm going to introduce the rabbit risk calculator. I'm going to talk about some of the nuances of hepatitis B uh, screening and screening for latent TB and then wrap up with vaccines and spend a few minutes on the new herpes zoster vaccine. So I really like this figure. This uh, shows a nice depiction of the incident rate of serious infections with various biologics. This is from a 2015 paper by Dr. Strand that is the most uh, complete meta-analysis to date of uh, clinical trials of biologics for RA. And uh, I don't know if you can see the numbers, but it shows that um, between three and five serious infectious events per 100 patient years um, is about the window they, they all fall in. This is serious infections, meaning uh, hospitalized or requiring IV antibiotics. I also like this table, which nicely depicts the uh, various infectious signals with different uh, biologics. And as you can see, they all increase the risk um, overall of non-serious and serious infections and bacterial infections in general. Um, and then we uh, worry about reactivation of TB and other non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections, in particular with uh, anti-TNFs and IL-6 inhibitors fungal and opportunistic infections with anti-TNFs and rituximab, uh, reactivation of hepatitis B, we get most concerned with rituximab, and then of course herpes zoster uh, with the JAK inhibitors. This point was uh, nicely made by Dr. Looney this morning, and I just want to re-emphasize because it's so important to, although I'm talking about preventing infections in the setting of biologics, not to forget about glucocorticoids and the impact they have on risk of infection. This, as I see, is uh, the real problem. As we know, the majority of patients with RA are on prednisone, um, and this is a real problem because while they're recommended uh, for short-term use, in reality, patients are on them longer term, and they uh, in are an independent predictor of infection in patients on TNF inhibitors, both serious and non-serious infections, opportunistic infections, not to mention the other adverse events associated with steroids. And most importantly to remember is the dose-dependent uh, increased risk of infection, and doses over 10 to 15 milligrams per day significantly increase the risk. Uh, so the bottom line here is that yes, biologics do cause infection, but they allow us to get our patients off of steroids. This is how I like to approach uh, risk reduction in my patients. This should be a, a continuous loop that's revisited at every patient visit um, to identify and quantify their risk in terms and reduce their risk in terms of screening and appropriate vaccinations. And this is something that should be continuously readdressed every time I see our patients. Um, I'd like to briefly talk about the rabbit risk score, which is a very nice clinical tool that was designed to aid in um, predicting risk of infection. Um, it's an ongoing uh, prospective cohort was developed in 2011 on a cohort of 5,000 rheumatoid arthritis patients that are enrolled in this German biologic register, RABBIT. Uh, and this is the link here in your slides. It's a readily available tool. This link takes you to an easy-to-use website, and it's really nice to open conversation and a dialogue with your patients about risk of infection when you're considering making treatment changes or escalating immunosuppression. These are the parameters that are included in the tool. Age greater than or less to 60, or a hack score. If the patient's had a serious infection in the preceding 12 months, if they have COPD or other chronic lung disease, chronic kidney disease, if they've previously been on less than or greater than or equal to five biologics um, or DMARDs, and their glucocorticoid dose. So let's do a quick example, we have a 65-year-old female with rheumatoid arthritis and COPD who uh, was previously on methotrexate and is on prednisone 10 milligrams, and you want to start a TNF inhibitor. Her hack score is 1.25. So if you go to the website, this is what it looks like, and you just plug in all this information, and then at the bottom select TNF inhibitor, 
and it gives you that she uh, has a probability of serious infection during the next 12 months of 8.2%. Let's change things up a little bit, and I just increased her prednisone dose to 15 milligrams or greater, and calculate it again, and this has almost doubled her risk of serious infection. Uh, I like to use this a lot. I think it's a really nice tool. Um, and think about using it next time you have a patient in the clinic and are discussing uh, escalating their, their treatment. Moving on to screening, starting with hepatitis B. Uh, the incidence of hepatitis B in the U.S. is, is very low. It's less than 2%, but over the past decade, um, increasingly recognized has been the risk of reactivation of hepatitis B in the setting of immunosuppression. And this had been well described in cancer patients receiving rituximab. The, we see the reactivation with uh, chronic hepatitis B, meaning their hepatitis B surface antigen positive, and also in resolved infections, which means they're isolated core antibody positive. Uh, but the risk is greatest with hep B surface antigen carriers. As I mentioned, the risk is greatest with rituximab, but also present with TNF inhibitors, um, as well as tocilizumab and abatacept. This should always be on our radar, because uh, reactivation can occur even um, after therapy is stopped, and often that's when it occurs. Reactivation of hepatitis B is, can be fatal, but it's also preventable, which is why it's so important for us to screen for prior to starting immunosuppression. And while I'm on this topic, I'll mention screening for hepatitis C is also important. In, in appropriate patients, hepatitis C should be screened for as well now that it is a curable disease. And at the Cleveland Clinic, we use a hepatitis remote panel that includes a hepatitis C antibody, so it makes it easy for us to, to order them both at the same time. This is the updated black box warning uh, to rituximab that was added in, in 2013, warning us of the risk of hepatitis B reactivation. It had previously been mentioned in the warning and precaution portion of the label, but increased uh, cases led to the FDA's re-evaluating the risk and updating this label. So what are the ACR guidelines for screening for hepatitis B? It's not exactly clear. They definitely need updating. They're based largely on expert consensus. Um, they recommend high-risk patients receiving lefunamide or methotrexate should be screened. Um, they ask us to stratify risk in our patients, which is a tricky thing to do. They say that appropriate evaluation might include hep B surface antigen, uh, surface antibody, and core antibody. They don't give us a specific algorithm. And they warn us of the risk of reactivation in the setting of biologics, but they don't ex tell us exactly how to screen for it. So they're long overdue for an update. They are they're outdated. They're over 10 years old. Um, and we'll stay tuned for an update of these guidelines. Uh, but fortunately, in 2015, published by the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases, uh, is a very nice recommendations um, that we at our institution follow for screening for hepatitis B. And they make things very simple. They say there's good evidence to support routine screening of all patients prior to undergoing chemotherapy or immunosuppressive therapy. They stratify uh, drugs by risk. Uh, just remember on the top, rituximab, very high risk of reactivation in uh, chronic hep B. High dose corticosteroids are high. Anti-TNFs, uh, moderate risk, and DMARDs, low risk. This is their specific algorithm. I won't get into the details of it, but all you need to remember is these top two boxes. If you plan to immunosuppress your patients, screen them for hepatitis B. It's as simple as that. And then if anything comes up further down the algorithm, just uh, befriend your hepatology colleagues. Screening for latent TB. TB is not uh, endemic in the U.S., but there are 13 million cases of, of latent TB, and in healthy persons, about 5% will reactivate uh, to active TB, and this is, risk is much higher in patients receiving TNF inhibitors. Uh, TNF is crucial for granuloma formation and maintenance, and we have studies that show identifying and treating latent TB prior to starting biologics uh, prevents a reactivation to, to active TB. Modalities that we have to screen for latent TB, we have our tuberculin skin test and our newer interferon gamma release assays. They both are wrought with 
disadvantages, uh, and neither of them differentiate latent TB from active TB, but they're all we have to work with at the moment. Um, the tuberculin skin test, or PPD, as you all know, detects cell-mediated immunity to mycobacterium tuberculosis through a delayed type hypersensitivity to the heat-killed uh, tuberculosis, and it's read by skin induration after injection of the PPD, and the antigens are shared by a variety of other mycobacterium, including a BCG, um, an M. bovis, limiting its specificity in, in patients that have received the BCG vac vaccine. Uh, it has limited sensitivity in immunosuppressed patients. There's a lot of energy. There's a boosting phenomenon in that some patients that do have latent TB, their reactivity to PPD will have waned and their first tests will be negative and only test positive upon a repeat PPD several weeks later. Also, it requires two clinic visits to have the PPD placed and then come back and have it read. The newer interferon gamma release assays uh, measure in vitro interferon gamma production upon stimulation with specific antigens that are much more specific uh, for TB and uh, most importantly, they're not present in, in BCG, so that has a better specificity in patients that have received that vaccine. There's two different tests, the quantiferon gold, which is what we use at our institution in the T-spot. Advantages, um, aside from improved specificity in patients who have received uh, BCG years, it's a single visit, one blood test. The disadvantages, however, are indeterminate results. Uh, the test is reported as positive or negative or this gray zone of indeterminate, and the risk of indeterminate result is uh, increased in patients with uh, rheumatic diseases. We looked at this at our institution, uh, 3,000 patients with rheumatic diseases and found a rate of over 5% of indeterminate results uh, compared to healthy controls and other generally sick hospitalized patients where the rate was a little over 1%. And this was significantly affected by glucocorticoids. So just remember that when you're sending a quantiferon test in your patients. Uh, and ideally, it should be ordered before you start any immunosuppression so that you don't have to worry about this. The ACR guidelines of the 2015 for the treatment of RA um, recommend screening with a skin test or a quantiferon before biologics or tofacitinib, and they state that the quantiferon is preferred if the patient has received BCG. Just to note that the American Thoracic Society um, and IDSA guidelines prefer the quantiferon over the skin test. Moving on to vaccinations, you've all seen this figure from the um, RA treatment guidelines telling us that killed vaccines like pneumococcal influenza and hepatitis B can be given in the setting of DMARDs or biologics, uh, while live vaccines like the herpes zoster vaccine or Zostavax are contraindicated in the setting of biologics and should be given prior to administrating biologics. Patients underlying rheumatic diseases and the immunosuppressive medications they're on pose a challenge for vaccine efficacy. Important things to remember are with rituximab, there is decreased efficacy of the influenza and pneumococcal vaccines. If possible, you want to wait as long after their last rituximab infusion to administer their vaccine. With tofacitinib, there's decreased efficacy of the pneumococcal vaccine, but not influenza. Live virus vaccines are contraindicated, as we know, in the setting of biologics, and if you need to administer a live vaccine, biologics should be held for four weeks and resume two to four weeks after administering the vaccine. Bottom line is best time to vaccinate is before methotrexate and tofacitinib biologics, and especially rituximab. I will wrap up with talking about herpes zoster, uh, which is uh, wildly increased incidence in our patients with rheumatic diseases and carries with it significant morbidity and, and complications. This graph shows uh, this increased incidence in, in our patients. Over on the left, in U.S. adults age 50, the incident rate uh, is four per thousand patient years and is over double that in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and over 10 times that in RA patients receiving tofacitinib uh, in patients with GPA. So a real a problem and we need to be vigilant about um, vaccinating. 
The RA treatment guidelines, I won't spend too much time on this because this is pre the new herpes zoster vaccine, the Shingrix or subunit vaccine, um, but they do endorse um, the Zostavax and giving it to uh, patients um, over 50 and of course contraindicated in the setting of biologics. And just briefly, a little bit about Zostavax, the live virus vaccine. Um, in the shingles prevention study, the pivotal trial that led to its approval, it decreased um, herpes zoster by 51% and its complication post-herpetic neuralgia by 67% and is recommended for uh, healthy patients 50 and older uh, and is contraindicated in anything more than mild immunosuppression and, of course, biologics. Who should we be vaccinating? This um, might be a moot point after I... Uh, the introduction and FDA approval of Shingrits, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, but currently Zostavax is, as I said, contraindicated in the setting of biologics. It's unclear if this concern is valid. There have been uh, papers, small numbers of, of patients on biologics who received uh, Zostavax with no issue, and there's an ongoing uh, VERV trial. Kevin Winthrop, Jeff Curtis, uh, enrolling RA patients on, uh, by, on TNF inhibitors and in administering uh, Zostavax, which is ongoing, and so far there have been no safety signals. However, enter the new herpes zoster vaccine. This is called Shingrix. It's a non-live recombinant subunit vaccine uh, that's combined with a potent adjuvant system, and it's administered with two intramuscular doses given two to six months apart and is approved for adults aged 50 and over. And in the studies that led to its approval, showed a over 90% um, efficacy at preventing zoster compared to the 50% with Zostavax. And this uh, efficacy was sustained over four years. So it was tested in, in two studies in patients uh, age 50 and older and in 70 and older. And this um, efficacy uh, was evident even in patients 80 and older. And per uh, the ACIP now, this is the preferred shingles vaccine. There are, however, several areas of uncertainty, um, especially in our patients, concern for risk of exacerbation or development of autoimmune symptoms. Uh, in the trials there, I think 80% of patients had reaction to the vaccine, including fevers, chills, myalgias, and somewhere around 12% of those were uh, severe enough to, to interfere with their daily activities. Um, this adjuvant system is very potent, and we worry about um, revving up the immune system and, and causing trouble in our, our patients. And there is no data in administering Shingrix in patients um, with rheumatic diseases or on immunosuppression. So we'll definitely be waiting to see, um, get some data on that for sure. This uh, was approved, FDA approved in October, in the same month the ACIP updated their uh, adult immunization schedule uh, to prefer Shingrix over Zostavax in patients 50 and over, including patients who have already received Zostavax and in patients who've already had shingles. And like I said, it's two doses, two to six months apart. And uh, we will be awaiting data on administering this in our patients with rheumatic diseases. So my take home points are prior to initiation of biologic therapy, remember to assess risk and screen in particular for hepatitis B and latent TB. And don't forget about every visit, reassessing vaccinations, are your patients uh, up to date on their vaccinations? Remember the rabbit risk calculator, here's the website. Think about using this uh, with your patients in clinic. I find it to be very helpful. Before starting any immunosuppression, screen your patients for hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Check a quantiferon prior to uh, TNF inhibitor therapy and note its shortcomings, in particular indeterminate results. And again, always assess vaccination status and always give your patient your yearly flu shot. That was all I had. Thank you.